Okay, so this topic is a very hot topic. Just like all of the other topics we're discussing, the legal reform, social and uh, security aspects, I'd like to invite to the stage uh, the uh, panelists for the upcoming panel. First of all, moderator Dr. Edith Shafran Gittelman, INSS senior researcher. And the panelists... Colonel in Reserves Advocate Pnina Sharvit Baruch, a head of a law and national security program at the INSS. <laughs> Professor Muhammad Watad, INSS senior researcher. <laughs> and Professor Ifat Biton, president of the Ahva Academic uh, College. And she'll be joining us. Le ladies, sir, the floor is yours. We call this the reform of the judicial system, social aspects as well, security aspects, and I allow myself to add to the title also police and democratic aspects, not only to suit myself to the uh, professions of the panelists, but because I think we're at a juncture where we're dealing with three dimensions. First of all, the democratic you know, and regime uh, structure. We talk about judicial reform versus a, a government revolution. The, the second thing is social resilience. What are the impact of this reform and uh, initiatives? And finally, the security aspects that are impacted by this legislation. So let's begin with you, Muhammad, if that's okay. In recent weeks, uh, we can talk about the we talk about uh, a 61 uh, vote majority and the committee for panel appointment, maybe even a, a basic law of legislation. We're talking about the powers of the president, but it's maybe a wrong thing to talk about judicial revolution as if we're talking about some basic fundamental is a principle of a state and not our country and our context. And I think this is a particularly significant day to discuss it. So maybe we can hear your opinion and your point of view. What is the great concern? Is it just the change of the judicial system? Or is there a real concern here that's f more focused on the reality in Israel right now? Thank you for the question and thanks for inviting me. The concern is not down to the details of what's called the reform. You can always talk about the details, the ins and outs. People have always argued about it in academia. Yeah, that can be discussed. But the real concern is putting all of government power in one authority, the uh, executive branch, which is already enormously powerful, which is already in uh, holding power over the legislative branch, and there's no separation of powers in this situation. And within that, take that authority, which is already weak, the judicial uh, uh, authority, also in terms of its basic uh, law, its, constitu uh, its rights, even in terms of budget, even the committee for the judge appointment is headed, of course, by someone from the executive branch, the Minister of uh, Justice and to put a gun to the judicial system's head and say, not only you can't, can't you intervene in government decisions, meaning uh, the government, but if you do so, I have the power to reverse your decisions. So why even go to the court? Now the question that is more amazing here is, why should a government that currently uh, comprises the coalition, why should it do it if tomorrow it may be in the opposition. I mean, they this weapon may be used against it. And the answer, the inherent answer, my answer to that, if I read uh, legal history correctly in other countries, not only in Israel, is that this particular government wants to change all judicial system rules, all government rules, so that it stays here in power, not democratically. And uh, they'll always say, but the law says. They'll always claim that the law it gives us the power. And that's why it's called a reform, uh, a, a judicial uh, uh, coup and not a judicial reform. How will they do this? I mean, we can see the, we see the initial buds of this, of entrenching themselves in power. This is not hysterical uh, concerns. We already see uh, the right to v uh, be elected and to vote. We can see the uh, marginalization of minorities. 
your your concerns are very valid. For years, we were told about the constitutional enterprise in the form of basic rules, basic laws. And one of the pillars of the state of Israel is supposed to be the legislation basic rule that is supposed to uh, uh, basically uh, lay out the foundations for the relationship between the various branches of power. So let's do that. Let's talk about the relationship between the powers of uh, the powers. But they don't want to do that because in the foundation here is to restrict the power of the government and they don't want their power restricted. So that they say the Supreme Court can't overturn rules unless they have a full majority. And if it's called a basic law in Israel, so there's no judicial uh, uh, purview. So what are the standards for calling a law a basic law? Well, the Knesset decides. Oh, so they're not really basic laws. It's just a title. So the the Supreme Court is emasculated. Now, you can hear from my voice that as a man of academia, I don't agree with every decree of the Supreme Court, but that's not what concerns me. What concerns me is the very independence of the Supreme Court, the ability of a judge to make a decision without thinking at night what the prime minister will say about him or her or a Knesset member will say about him or her. And that's what they want to take away from the court, their ability, their immunity to make impartial decisions. There is no high, super, uh, high court any more. There is no Supreme Court. There's no point in going to court. There's no point in going to Jerusalem. That's what this government wants to do. Ifat, you are also known as someone who has a lot of critique for the courts. And we've heard throughout the week that this reform, so to speak, is based on public sentiment that uh, the, 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 the courts have always been an Israeli junta and they're corrupt and they need to be organized. But let's, hand on heart, let's say this sentiment is uh, to some degree valid. Some people feel this way. And I'm asking you, is this reform and the motivation to instate this reform address a real sentiment that the courts need to be repaired? Or is it a different motivation that's pushing this reform and that I assume we can all un understand the significance of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you for all this, for the invite to be here today. Well, as you said, I think there are two sentiments at play that I uh, see very clearly, uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, a significant support for uh, uh, quite a number in the public for this reform. On the one hand, we hear what Muhammad says, uh, we, we, sh I mean, w we should be amazed that not every single person is protesting uh, because what's being done to the courts, I I eviscerating the courts. I mean, uh, the other, uh, uh, you know, the only offset to that is that power is taken away from citizens to protect themselves because th from the government, meaning the courts were supposed to protect pe <laughs> people. Be um translating what Muhammad said a bit and adding to it. But the, the Supreme Court is not some sanctity, sanctified body, but if we want checks and balances, and certainly checks and balances against the aggressive, belligerent, pa belligerent interest-based, even not even evil, but just interest-based, uh, interest-driven of the government uh, and their actions. Um, and we heard yesterday about uh, the plan to uh, intervene in the pensions so they can pay for everything they want. Who will the citizens turn to if not the courts? So the courts are their protection. If that's the situation, then we should, where, why is not everybody protesting? And not everybody is protesting. So I think in this regard, yes, there is, in answer to your question, uh, people that are coalescing, let's say, uh, around old wounds, around uh, things that have concerned people with the courts, things that have been concerned with for years. One concern is against the entire system, the judicial system. I can tell you that I've seen, been in a lot of home meetings, house meetings with people, talking to people. I, I don't really talk so much as listen to people talk. Basic citizens talking about what they feel and the fact that they went to the courts maybe in their and and it took time for the courts to give them a due da a date uh, for their proceedings and they even they came 
uh, with all of the documentation that they needed, they didn't get the justice. And there are those that, uh, and people who got justice, but uh, justice was never enforced because even if the court decree is in your favor, it takes years to see reparations. And oftentimes you don't see any reparations whatsoever. People have had problems and grief against the court for years for all of for various reasons so that's one form of sentiment where the judicial system is not i don't know popular enough popular in you know the very pure sense of popularity meaning it's not part of popular sentiment and people don't feel connected to the judicial system and the second sentiment is first israel second israel meaning the case system which has to do more with uh, the elitism of the supreme court but not only that as well there are other issues and there we see a great deal of homogeneity among the people who are for this reform. If we're talking about representation of minorities and marginalized uh, communities among the Supreme Court, certainly Arabs and Eastern descent Jews, there are two, they are have their own grife and complaints. So there are two sentiments in play that are making people very struggle to say, don't touch this holy sanctity of the courts. Yeah, you can, you can move it, you can change it. So not only, but we know when we read the articles of this reform that have nothing to do with these two sentiments. They don't address anything, not c potential corruption in the court, not elitism of the court. The, the reform doesn't address any of this. So if you ask me personally, if, uh, if I have any insights uh, about what's happening, and I hope that we don't continue to see this insight unfolding because I really want to be optimistic and I don't want this reform to be carried out. My insight is that the reform has nothing to do with the, uh, the p potentially valid grife or strife that people have against the courts and against systems in power. And that I hope that we'll be able to coalesce as a people and bring come together. And that's something that we have to take into consideration because even if we have these very impressive uh, you know, systems, and our judicial system is considered one of the most impressive there is, one of the most successful there are in the world, and I think that if we're dismantling it, we have to consider that as well. And how do we make sure not to lose uh, uh, attention, also to valid critique, to make corrections that need to be corrected even in the midst of this great attack? So when you talk about paying attention, what do you mean? I mean, in the populist sort of discourse, they say the Supreme Court is too homogenous. They're, you know, elitist bunch of people talking to themselves. Okay, are we talking about diversity? Because diversity is easy to tackle. That's a problem that can be resolved with appropriate representation. But it seems to me that what you're talking about is not just technically diversity, but the stance of the court. Yes, it's a mu much more substantive issue. People don't necessarily know how to take it a step ahead. They uh, view it, you know, in a simpler way as this is a source of power and we want some of that power. You know, the court is a source of power. We want some of the pie. We want it to protect us. I mean, one of the things that we hear very time is where was the High Court of Justice during the disengagement plan? Where was it? And, why, you know, people will say, how does this have to do with anything? The Supreme Court of Justice doesn't determine policy. It only reacts to policy and claims that are brought before it. But, okay, but I think it's important to hear what this recurring claim means. And this recurring claim means that the public does see the High Court, the Supreme Court, as the body that's supposed to protect them, to protect the rights of people not to be trampled uh, by government. And this sentiment is a starting point because oftentimes, particularly where I am, people are just stuck in the frustration level. I mean, uh, how can you even talk about disengagement and connect it to this? What has it got to do with anything? No, you have to think about things in a form, in a broad historic sense. And when we understand it in that level, we understand that there is something substantive here that we're trying to think what kind of dynamic there is vis-a-vis -vis the, the Supreme Court. May, for example, in uh, interpretive law, for example, constitutional law, and how it relates to the Israeli judicial systems, to rights, to housing, to education, health, all of the stuff that is the stuff of life for people, and even more than that, uh, political rights, intellectual rights, and support. And we're harming the court. We're certainly harming the court. Uh, and uh, uh, the court, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, certainly is biased uh, against societal rights sometimes, but we look at this change and say, this is a step, this is a move to, to change which is being cut off in its infancy. So maybe we can talk about specific populations that claim where the courts were never fair, where they say the courts, n the courts never protected them. Haredi Jews, for example, Arabs and so forth. But I want to come back to you, Penina, because we're talking about national security. That's the day we're in. So once let's talk about the implications, not slogans, but real implications, how this reform will impact our national security. Because we all know today uh, and we've heard today that the reform uh, harms, of course, the independence of the Supreme Court and the independence of the judicial system. And we can also, the impact on uh, soldiers, the Hague was mentioned again and again. So uh, I'd like you to address this and say, is it a real threat or is it populist slogans? Because it doesn't only impact this reform on the international community, it impacts there's, uh, there's a fear, at least, that this reform will truly impact national security. I mean, it's true that national security is a big title that includes almost anything, but if you could address national security in a way that's not necessarily external, meaning how do, can we look inside to our basic needs? If I can say something that really relates to what Ifat said, I think that we are a country with a great need to balance between c conflicting values. Certainly there's the security issue. That includes oftentimes uh, injury or violation of uh, personal rights, arrests, meaning uh, versus human, general human rights. We have the clash of you know, our uh, occupation of the Palestinians and a lot of really serious, heavy, uh, legally r ramification, uh, legally implicated issues. So we have plenty of value, judicial, uh, moral, ideological dilemmas, but we still want to maintain our democracy, we still want to maintain religion versus state, and maybe it all comes down to, uh, to being Jewish and democratic, Jewish in the national religious sense, democratic in terms of the democratic and liberal sense. Chaim Mendelbrin talked about li the liberal aspect of democracy yesterday. I think what happened over the years, particularly within our society, there are factors pulling in different directions, and it would be a lot easier for the Knesset and for the government, for the parliament, not for the parliament, uh, the government, sorry, not to enter this issue of judicial decrees. And and I mean, it was comfortable to accept political constraints in the past because the uh, national uh, uh, religious uh, uh, sector uh, uh, could be. Uh, handled in that way. And I can tell you as someone who was in the system for many years, it was oftentimes very convenient for the government, instead of being the ones that say no to the Haredis or to the Haredi party or the you know right-wing religious parties, instead of being the ones to say no, and I don't think it's the right thing to do, but instead of saying, I don't know, uh, we in the government, let's see what the courts say, and rolled it across to the court and we can see oftentimes that the court had to take upon itself these, no, they did the, the, the court didn't take upon itself these cases. These cases were pushed at the court so that politicians wouldn't have to handle the mess. They pushed it at the court. I was in deliberations where time and time again, the government asked for postponements and uh, they got postponements because they didn't want to make the decisions. And then the Supreme Court was the one that had to make the final decision and to uh, ma maintain both liberalism and democracy because that's what the government wanted to do anyway, but it was convenient to not be the bad guy in the scenario and let the courts do it. And now what's happening is that that minority that was constantly blocked for years that way, blocked because it was convenient for the government to block them, uh, to block them using the courts. Now they have such a political power, they're not a majority, but they have such political power that they want to throw this barrier away. They want to eliminate it. And the real concern to national security, in my opinion, is that when we had uh, 
uh, Ludi Dekin and I were a team several years ago when we talked about national security. National security, even in the idea of strategy, is to defend not only the physical existence of the state of Israel, but also its essence. Its essence meaning what we see in the Declaration of Independence, a Jewish democratic state. And when we harm that essence and remove the barriers that protect that essence, that protects its democracy, that is harm to national security. Beyond that, and that's also what, and what people have talked about this a great deal, uh, that, that what held it, what the solidarity that, that, that held us together as a society are those same values of the Declaration of Independence. Once we violate that uh, balance, that harmony, then we don't have national re security, we don't have uh, uh, societal resilience, we are impeding the strength of the IDF and we're collapsing the country from within and it's an internal implosion. So then, so we don't feel solidarity, we don't have any sort of collective idea of ourselves, what happens next? I mean, uh, isolationism, people, what happens? It begins with that, people not going to the IDF and won't be recruited to certain, or oh, don't want to uh, follow, uh, you know, abide by the law because they no longer believe in the government. I, that instates these rules. The economic harm, I mean, our economic situation is part of our national resilience and part of our national security without high tech, without business. And by the way, high tech is in itself, by the way, a national security force. Uh, that's harm to us because we're harming high tech, we're harming industry, we're harming the economy. That's how we're harming national security in another aspect. And the previous panel discussed this, that we, there are minorities here in Israel, apart from the Jewish uh, minority, uh, and the Arab minority, but some of the ability of not to be incorporated, I mean, being a Jewish state is, is a difficult thing enough as it is, but the ability to be incorporated is to have rights and to have a court that maintains those rights. And we know this, and maybe there'll be legislation that really harms those rights. We're really pushing away, pushing the Arab public to options that are not conciliatory, not going to the courts, but taking up arms in the streets. So we are also dismantling this cohesion beyond the fact that if we're, we're opening the door to corruption, to uh, corrupt appointments, we can see what's happening in Russia. Some of the failure of the Russian military is they were sent with bad equipment. Why do they have bad equipment? Because the Putin's corrupt friends are the ones that uh, 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 sideline the deal. So if you have a corrupt government, it trickles down. Even military equipment can be harmed. And so that all comes down to national security. Thank you. Thank you. In a conversation that we have preparing for this conference, we discussed the fact that this reform started, of course, the override, uh, override uh, uh, um, uh, bill and uh, clause and the uh, judge appointment committee. Now, I think it's just not an override clause. It's just not come to that because some of the proponents of the reform was uh, that uh, said that the courts are too activists, that they overcome uh, political uh, decisions. So we uh, let's talk about this claim that, that the court is overly active. Let's talk about that. And because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just incorporating another question. You talked about the fact with some emotion, I believe, about that moment in truth, and you said, I expect judges to also quit. So what is the red line for you? Where people, you think that people have to put, you know, values over, you know, political clout or reality. Judges don't fund themselves. You don't need me for that, to know that. You just need to read the law that was written by the legislative body and held by, a, that was appointed by a committee that was uh, that is headed by the Minister of Justice. There are two co coalition members. They're also from the coalition. Two, three Supreme Court judges, two representatives of the uh, Bar Association. So fake news, fake news, fake news. People may climb that. You can hear it day and night, and it's not going to change the fact that the people who are there and convene there uh, uh, don't appoint themselves and don't fund themselves. But I do want to quote one judge that I'm sure that you're familiar with, and after I say the quote, I'm sure you'll know who I'm quoting. And he said this, in our constitutional uh, regime, right of freedom of, uh, of expression is an and this is 
Shergon and Gronat from 1951. He said, the freedom of expression is the foundation for democracy. He didn't have any of the basic laws that we have now to rely on. All he had of was the Declaration of the Independence. I have yet to see one democratic state that is ashamed of its Declaration of Independence. I can't get that. I don't get it. There is a seminal document for the establishment of the State of Israel. If I could now, I would wear that document as a robe. I would indulge in it. The Declaration of Independence is written beautifully, articulated beautifully. It talks to all aspects of Israel, every population in Israel, asking everybody to be equal under the law in order to build this new State of Israel. So the judges of the Supreme Court started intervening in government power from day one, in 1948, even before Aaron Barak's days. And even in the age of our great mentor, at least myself, Professor Aaron Barak, there was Meir Shamgar, and there was Ishak Zamir, and others. So it's not all Barak down to Barak. And there's one key problem. The legislator doesn't want to legislate. The government doesn't want to make government decisions. They want the court to consider it. So in 99, they wanted the High Court of Justice to pass appointments, and the High Court of Justice said, we're not the legislative body. You're the legislative body. You make the rules, and we'll just figure out how to interpret them. No, but there are things that you don't write down. They pushed it all on the high. They said that a person can't live in Katsir. Will said, we'll do a, a, a concurrent a claim against the High Court of Justice for people to have the right to live uh, wherever they wanted to live. But there was another article to that claim that said the uh, committee cannot r uh, discriminate against you know, race, gender, ethnicity, and so forth, and so on, and so forth. I don't want to see this situation in which the uh, Supreme, uh, judge, uh, Supreme Court judges take down their robes, take off their robes, and leave their seats. I think it's a very dramatic move, and I hope it never happens, but it's good to have it as a last resort. But the day in which this legislation passes, if it becomes a real law in Israel, it's better for the Supreme Court judges to arise from their seats and leave. Because the alternative is that petitions be brought before them, and then they will have to declare them as laws, as constitutional. And then we will see what we are all, left and right, Arabs and Jews, don't want to see that police officers and security officers get conflicting orders, and that the one from the government and one from the courts, and the police officer is the one who has to make the decision. We all have to be Israelis together. Thank you. We have to uh, clear our own seats in just a second. So, Yifat, just one moment. We know why the Declaration of Independence is is supposed to be our guideline. It talks about equality. That's the word that appears so often, however hard to believe it is today. Should the state of Israel maintain the principle of equality in its documents, in its legislation? The law of equality, the principle of equality, is instated in our basic laws, in our uh, and uh, of uh, the constitutional uh, basic law, and the human dignity law, and the freedom of occupation law. And uh, this is laws that have already been passed. This was uh, basically um, an amendment to previous or to the first constitution law. And this was under the Knesset, where it was under the Likud power, Likud, the right wing. And they still said that, they, that all of these laws, all of these new basic laws should be passed within the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. So uh, there's nothing but it's like these banal anecdotes, certainly for uh, uh, lawyers like ourselves or legal experts, in which, I mean, these laws are so basic, are so simple. They mention the Declaration of Independence. They mention them. They reference them as the foundational or referential document. You had to specifically refer to the Declaration of Independence while legislating these laws, these basic laws of the State of Israel. And that's why this change is so uh, impactful. So one final word to you, Plina. I think you talked about externally and internally. We have you know, this idea of strategy. When you do something and you give up both advantages and disadvantages, I mean, a, a responsible government had to think, what do I win, what do I lose? In this current reality, everybody is about to lose, and the government is about to lose as well. So this conduct is bad for 
uh, our national security, bad for our national cohesion. There's no explanation for what they're trying to push other than a group that wants narrow political interests of their own, and I hope that they renege. That's what I hope. Thank you for the three of you. Thank you all to all of our panelists for their participation.